Okay. Hi, everyone. Is the, work, is the mic working? Okay. So welcome back from the break. My name is Renata Lemus. I am a, a senior economist at the World Bank. Um, I actually specifically asked to chair this, section, this session. I'm very excited about this topic. Uh, the session is on implementation. Um, I always liked how diverse um, the RISE crowd is. Uh, I think we all work in different topics. I think one thing that we have in common is that we've all suffered through uh, implementation uh, of programs. I'd say Paul, perhaps, as we've seen today, has suffered way more than we have. Um, <laughs> Um, so this um, session is going to actually, um, the presenters are going to present to you uh, three pieces of work uh, providing uh, research evidence on uh, implementation issues. So Claire um, will first, uh, will show a study uh, that asks which type of education interventions uh, during emergencies at what scalable delivery modes can improve learning uh, across a range of contexts and countries. No one will then um, go on to, he will go a step further and ask the question about what drives the variation in effectiveness. Can um, programs be uh, generalizable? And uh, he's going to look at uh, data from five uh, countries or different contexts and also uh, use the results to inform a new um, RCT in Botswana. And Zara uh, will present a third paper. Uh, that asks the question of what governments are doing to support uh, implementation from more from a management perspective um, to then achieve uh, improvements in uh, the downstream delivery chain. So three very exciting papers. And I also want to say that this, you know, we've never had a session on implementation, so it's very nice to have one now, even though if we always talk about implementation, um, but also it's a really nice way to motivate the next session um, which is going to be on a discussion of implementation and also to motivate the work that it's being led now by the work, uh, Works uh, Hub uh, initiative. Thank you. Claire. Awesome. Great. Hi, everybody. So my name is Claire Cullen, and I'm presenting joint work with nine esteemed co-authors, some of whom are in the room. Uh, you can imagine a, an RCTs run across five different countries involved huge teams, and so also some of the research staff are also in the room. Uh, so the title of today's paper is Building Resilient Education Systems, Evidence from Large-Scale Randomized Trials in Five Countries. So the key thing I want you to take away from this slide is that education emergencies are really common and they're really costly. So we've uh, done some web scraping and got a database going of an index of school closure length by the number of affected people by, for disruptions that end up closing schools. And you can see essentially this covers uh, countries around the world and at high frequency. And obviously with climate change, we're gonna expect these number of disasters at closed schools to increase. So in some, over 2 billion people live in countries that are affected by shocks that end up disrupting education frequently. And these span things from like pollution, air pollution, teacher strikes, closed schools, conflict, climate disasters, floods, and other natural disasters. Uh, and so in recognition of the scale of the problem, the UN has established a global fund for education called Education Cannot Wait. And they estimate that 220 million children need access to emergency education programs at any point in time. Yet, in spite of the scale of the issue, there's really limited experimental evidence on what works uh, to support children in education emergencies. So we know that there's a large literature on the cost of school disruption, but there's less evidence on ways to stem these learning losses uh, during education emergencies. But we are now seeing through COVID, we've seen a few papers come out. And so there's like an emerging literature on ways to um, stem education losses during closures uh, and also in emergency settings. So what I'm presenting today, I'm just going to tell you a bit about the program. It's called Connect Ed, uh, and it's a targeted foundational numeracy tutoring program that's delivered through phone calls and SMSs. And so the origin is, as we've heard now a lot today, uh, Youth Impact, an NGO based in Botswana, was implementing teaching at the right level for a number of years before COVID. And then obviously in COVID, schools closed and students couldn't get access to that program. And so essentially Connect Ed borrows the principles from teaching at the right level. So targeted foundational um, tutoring uh, and 
It delivers it through one weekly SMS program. So students get this very big, basic weekly set of SMS problems, and then a 20 minute weekly phone call with an instructor. And they might be a school teacher or a volunteer or a, an NGO worker. Uh, and in this call, it's really targeted to the student's level. So what happens is there's like a baseline assessment. You figure out, is the student at addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division level? And then based on that initial assessment, the next level, the next week's call teaches them at the level that they're at. And then there's a checkpoint question at the end of that. So if they're taught addition, you get a question on addition. If you get addition correct, the next week you're taught subtraction. If you get it incorrect, you're taught addition again the following week. So it's really well targeted. So the conceptual framework that uh, this program was designed under and the plat mechanisms through which it's worked, um, through which it works is essentially platform and pedagogy. So it's trying to reach students through a platform at the right level. So at the level that they're at, we know mobile phones are really widely accessible in low and middle income countries. So it's not just like across countries, but also within countries, low income households often have access to a phone. So in our study countries in particular, uh, there's 100, on average 108 phone subscriptions per 100 uh, members of the population. Uh, and there's also really widespread phone network coverage. So in Nepal, which has the lowest um, access in our, in our setting, 97% of households have access to sufficient network coverage to get a phone call. And another mechanism through which we expect this program to be working is through pedagogy. So it's teaching at the right level as well. So it's instructed uh, instruction that's targeted to the student's level, which there's obviously a wealth of knowledge that this room has produced or is familiar with. Uh, and there's also a growing literature on the impact of one-on-one -on -one tutoring programs, largely from uh, higher income countries, but also growing in lower income countries. So uh, this program, as I mentioned, was first developed in the early days of COVID. So it was done by Youth Impact. They ran a quick randomized control trial with a few researchers. Uh, in 2020, it was one of the first studies in education um, during COVID. And then after that program found that, found that it was really effective and cost effective, then a lot of other organizations and governments were keen to try it out in their setting. And so we ran randomized trials with these partners in five different countries. So to give you a sense of the timeline, so the Botswana proof of concept in 2020, and then the trial in Kenya, Nepal, India, Philippines, and Uganda um, over the space of the next couple of years. So the study characteristics, so the sample, I guess, like for a lot of teaching at the right level programs uh, is in like early grade. So we have in Kenya, it was grades one and two in the other settings, typically grades three to five, which is when this, um, the content is covered in a lot of national curricula. Uh, the studies uh, in all five countries, we had the phone call and SMS, but in all the countries except for India, we also want to try this potentially really cost effective version of just the weekly SMS. If that worked, that would be extremely cost effective. Um, and in terms of implementer type, we also have a different number of different types of implementers. So a mix of NGOs as well as government teachers. Uh, and in two contexts, which I'll tell you some more about, but in Nepal and the Philippines, we randomly assign students to get implemented, the program implemented by either government teachers or by NGO workers. And the length of the program was roughly uh, about eight weeks. Uh, we find you can look in the paper, but in the appendix, we show there's really broad geographic spread in a lot of these countries. Uh, schooling was disrupted in all settings, and it was common programming. So there were obviously like small tweaks, like the um, being delivered in students' language of instruction um, or translating it, sorry, to, to each country, um, but very common programming across the board. As I mentioned, NGO and government delivery, and an, at end line, an average successful reinterview rate that was 78% and balanced across all arms. So what did we find? So first looking at these first two red bars, uh, you can see the impact of the SMS program. This is in standard deviations. So we find 0.083 standard deviation improvement in learning outcomes on like a simple like phone-based ASR assessment um, uh, for that's pulled across all countries. And then the next red bar is pulled across all countries, the phone and SMS impact. So that's 0.327 standard deviation improvement in learning, which is really substantial. I'm sure this room is very familiar, but like a 0.1 standard deviation improvement in learning is considered pretty great. Uh, and so this program, obviously during COVID, when not huge amounts else was happening, but extremely effective. And then if you look at the green set of three bars, this shows the effects just for Nepal and the Philippines, where we had randomly assigned students to receive the program by other government teachers or NGO. 
And these are um, not statistically significantly different. So equal effects depending on who was your implementer, which suggests like potential scalability within the government. So it's always standard deviations um, are always a bit controversial. It's not very obvious. So let's drill down to something that's a bit more intuitive. So this shares the share, shows the share of students who got the division questions correct in Uganda in grade four and five. So a couple of things to take away. The first one is you can see the control group has learning losses from baseline to end line. So this is the grade five students. There's a reduction in the share of students who can get division correct. We also see that the program, this purple bar here, uh, fully recovers these learning losses. So it's higher, like it's above the baseline level in the control group. And then these gains obviously dwarf what students are learning from a typical year. So obviously this is COVID, but just it's useful to know that 17% of students in grade four got division correct and 21% got uh, it correct in grade five. So everyone is always very curious about the country by country level results. And so what you can see here is, I guess, uh, it's worth noting that in the Philippines and Uganda, these countries had some of the world's longest school closures. And so in these two contexts, we find the SMSs worked, but we don't find that they worked in Kenya or Nepal, whereas we find really consistently positive effects for the phone and SMS. So you can see the phone call and SMS arm uh, had positive effects across all settings. So how, why do we think this worked and why did it seem to work across all settings? So back to the conceptual framework, I guess, we do find evidence is consistent with reaching people at the right level. So this is a platform that people have, a lot of people have, they're willing to uh, use and engage with. So we had really high consent rates to participate and then really high engagement each week. So over 90% of households in the phone call arm had a language, had a week of instruction at least one point during the intervention with an average weekly um, engagement rate of 70 to 80%. There was also really high demand. So at Endline, for example, as well, we found 97% of control households wanted the program and 100% in the treatment group, uh, as well as a six percentage point increase in willingness to pay for the program. And then on pedagogy, we're finding some evidence consistent with the idea that this is teaching students at the right level. So what we would expect if targeting, um, like for a targeted kind of instruction program, that the program would be just as effective if it's, if it's targeted at students who know no operations versus students who know multiplication at end line. And that's what we find. We find no heterogeneous treatment effects by baseline level. And similarly for gender. Perfect, thanks. Uh, and then like also consistent with this story is when, as I mentioned before, we have this like great monitoring data where we know what student was taught one week, if they got the checkpoint correct, and then what they were taught the following week. So we can back out from that if it was accurately targeted to the student's level. And so when we plot accurate targeting trial by trial, we find that accuracy improves each trial. And then we also, when we plot um, impact trial by trial, we also find the same, the same shape. So we're finding that impact is in improving trial by trial. And so that is consistent with a story that targeting uh, is improving along with, um, with impact. Uh, and obviously everyone uh, might be a bit skeptical about a phone-based assessment. So we've done a number of robustness checks. So we find the same impacts, whether the assessment is done over the phone or in person, the same impacts, whether it's uh, a student is retested using back checks, same impacts, whether students are randomly assigned to different math problems of the same difficulty level. Uh, and also we do an effort task and we find that there's no treatment effect on effort. So it suggests that students, it's actual knowledge change. It's not just extra effort. So what have I shown you? So I've shown you results from large-scale randomized trials in five countries evaluating a phone-based education program. We find that despite these really five really different countries, we find consistently large and robust positive effects on learning point, between 0.3 and 0.35 standard deviations, which shows that these phone calls can scale across countries. We find similar effects when we randomized whether the implementer was an NGO or a government implementer, which suggests potential scalability within government systems. We find that the program delivers, when we quantify it in, um, and look at cost, up to four years of high quality schooling for $100, which puts it in the bucket of a very cost effective program, obviously with the disclaimer that this is COVID, so I'll talk about that in future work. Uh, we also find evidence consistent with possible mechanisms of being using an accessible and at the right platform, uh, at the right level platform and pedagogy 
And then in future work, there are some other studies. So this was taken up in a few countries in South America. So working with the IADB to kind of reconcile these results and see how they aggregate. Uh, and then we're also looking to test this in additional emergency settings outside COVID um, and non-emergency settings. Uh, and then we're also supporting a few governments are keen to take this up. And so we're working with them to scale this program up. Thank you. Okay, so the title of my talk is Implementation Matters. Um, sounds pretty obvious, uh, except very few of us measure implementation, account for implementation, study implementation, optimize implementation. Um, so I just want a quick show of hands before I start. How many people, um, actually, you know what, let me do this. Percent of people here who think that over 50% of people measure implementation in their studies, raise your hand. Okay, pessimistic audience. Okay, if you did that last time also. <laughs> thank you, we need one person. Okay, Bela, thank you. Who thinks over 25% of people measure implementation? I knew that was also coming. Um, let's say people in this room, which is a selected sample. Okay, we had some hands over 20%. Over 15, okay, now hands are going up, zero. Okay, very realistic. 12% um, are measuring implementation. Oh, sorry, that's actually, that's the answer. That's not a question, okay? So I'm gonna come to that, but this sounds so obvious, but we're not really taking it seriously enough. And I would argue there's some similar statistics in just pure policy efforts, not just research efforts, actually. So I can talk about that. So I'm going to share a study called Implementation Matters, Generalizing Treatment Effects in Education. And this is joint with Rachel Meager. So I just want to start with some motivation on the type of intervention that we're about to aggregate to make this point. And of course, many of this, us in this room know this and have made this point and, and moved the agenda here, which is enrollments have gone up all over the world, but learning hasn't budged. Okay, so left-hand side is enrollment, learning on the right, uh, learning levels are low and haven't budged. But there, and many things that are really popular, and again, many people in this room have produced this evidence, uh, like flip charts, uh, grants, libraries haven't worked to improve learning, extra teachers, computers, you name it. There is a promising reform, uh, that many of us have also contributed to and heard about and talked about many times of targeting instruction, which has improved learning. And this idea is a simple one and, and we know it, which is grades uh, and school systems are structured by grade uh, on this uh, horizontal axis, but the level of the child really varies and often uh, teachers are teaching to the top of the class. So they're just reaching 10% of kids who are maybe at level in the grade. And so really we should try to flip uh, the instruction and target to kids level instead of grade and regroup them. So we, we, many of us in this room are familiar with this concept. This has worked, okay, so across a bunch of studies, uh, this is on the, the Tall Africa website, Teaching at the Right Level Africa website, over 0.1 standard deviation effectiveness across many of these studies. So this is good news. We don't always see this, as Claire just mentioned, point one is pretty good in education. Half of education interventions don't work at all, and point one is the median effectiveness. But there's another thing that, oh, so it works, okay? So people are really excited about it, and it's scaling. Okay? It's scaling, this is efforts supported by the World Bank, UNICEF, USAID, FCDO, Tall Africa, Pratham, JPAL, many people in the room, it's scaling, it works, it's very exciting. But there's also a lot of variation. Okay, so sometimes we're getting 0.08 standard deviations for this effect or this intervention, but sometimes 0.75. So what explains this difference? There could be many things that explain this difference. It could be the country context. It could be baseline levels of learning. It could be many, 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 many things. So that's one of the things that we set out to look at when we uh, did this study and started aggregating this evidence. So we did a systematic meta-analysis to unpack the generalizability and mechanisms of this approach and this evidence. How generalizable was this effectiveness really? Not just in terms of whether it was positive, but how effective it could be. If you can get to 0.8 instead of 0.08, 
That's a big deal. That's an order of magnitude difference. That's what we really want to address the learning crisis. What was driving these biggest effects? And we wanted to inform future work at, to, to ask ourselves as we're scaling approaches like teaching at the right level, what more should we be studying? Uh, what are the unanswered questions that we should be studying? So we looked at a bunch of the evidence. This isn't all the evidence on this approach, but we looked at a bunch of the evidence. And luckily, there's been a movement recently to also make a lot of this data available. So a lot of this data was available. Uh, and we gathered evidence from a bunch of these studies representing over 70,000 children. Uh, five states slash countries, eight treatment arms. Okay, so a few things we did with the data. I mean, one of the good, uh, some of the good news with this intervention uh, is the outcomes actually collected were quite similar. So it's very hard to do this kind of aggregation if the outcomes aren't very similar. But many of these studies used a similar assessment, the ASSER assessment. The Kenya study was the one exception, which had an 100 point uh, a test, but all the other studies had at uh, the same assessment. So my colleague, uh, Rachel, said this is great news because she had done an aggregation for microcredit and she said there uh, the measures were actually quite different. So she actually thought this was good. So I know we give ourselves a hard time in education and say the outcomes aren't comparable, but in this case, they, they were actually quite comparable. So that made this, uh, that facilitated this. We did need to standardize the data a little bit. So we actually replicated all the original studies. The good news is they, they all replicate by and large. Uh, but we standardized a few things. So we put standard deviations in terms of common measures uh, and a few other things. We used assessments that were at similar intervals and time periods. So we did a bunch of work. We ran the exact same specification uh, to really standardize this. Okay, so original estimates replicate well. There's no replication crisis here. Good news, few. We're hearing about a lot of replication crises, so that's good. Um, and something that we did, and now I'm getting to the implementation point, is we had a sense that implementation was going to be a really important variable and feature. And so we worked with uh, Pratham, with j and folks who'd been involved in the original studies to understand the features of the original studies. And we really wanted to get a measure of take up and fidelity. Okay, Did it happen? Who did it? And was it done as intended? Were the children really grouped at the level? And actually, good news, a bunch of the studies had this information, actually. but the effects on those who received the program weren't always calculated in the original studies. So a few of the studies calculated not just were the people who were randomized to the study, what happened to them, but also those who received the program. So for those who are familiar, intention to treat versus treatment on the treated. So we calculated treatment at the treated for, for all the studies. Okay, so that was a contribution, and we were curious to see how much that mattered. Okay, so we used, for take up, we used measures of student attendance and whether tall materials were spotted in the classroom during random monitoring visits. Uh, so we used that. And for fidelity, we used a measure of whether the students were grouped by level during these random monitoring visits. Take up existed in all the studies, fidelity only in a few. Okay, so that was, we, that's with a bit more of a caveat, but take up existed in all the studies. So what do we find? When we just look at intention to treat effects, uh, so this is those that were randomized to receive the program, uh, we're finding a few things. One thing we did, we segmented with who did it, teachers or volunteers, a bit of a generalization, uh, but teachers or volunteers by and large. And so when you just look at intention to treat, the teacher effect, the average effect is 0.07 standard deviation. Uh, it's statistically significant when you look at the average effect here. And the other interesting thing, and I'm not sure how familiar folks are with, with meta-analysis, but there's this metric of an I squared, which is used to quantify whether the variation and the difference across the studies is sampling variation versus true treatment effect variation. And so if the I squared is low, that means that any variation is just sampling variation. It's not true treatment effect variation. That's how this is typically interpreted. And here we found the I squared was 0.01%. So that suggested that these effects were by and large quite similar. You can also see that visually as well. Okay, so 0.07 standard deviations, uh, pretty similar across the settings and treatment arms. Volunteer effects, 0.24 standard deviation effectiveness. So on average, about three times more effective. So that's interesting in and of, in and of itself. But the I squared is really high, 95, 96%. They're not generalizing so well. 
uh, there's some, some important difference between these. Okay, so there's something interesting going on with the volunteers, uh, but it's, it's all over the map. When we look at treatment on the treated, this is such a beautiful graph. I love a beautiful graph. We don't always get such a beautiful graph. Rachel was actually shocked when we saw this. She said she'd never seen a meta-analysis produce such a clear result. Uh, you're seeing a few things. So one is uh, for the teachers, the average effects have gone up uh, quite a bit to 0.21 standard deviation. So when the teachers are doing it, okay, thank you. When the teachers are doing it, 0.21 standard deviations, which is great. The average effectiveness in education, as we said, is 0.1. So when the teachers are doing it, they're getting some big results. When the volunteers are doing it, uh, 0.76 standard deviations. So now this is on the upper, upper end of effectiveness in the literature. And the I squared is zero. Okay, so these measures of implementation, who did it and was it done, matter most, explain almost all the variation. Okay, more than baseline levels of learning, more than context, more than many other factors. So really, really striking result. This was a frequentist meta-analysis. Uh, some folks might know my colleague Rachel loves Bayesian meta-analysis. Uh, we also did a Bayesian meta-analysis. Uh, there's a few benefits of this. Um, I'm just going to describe one, uh, but there is a bunch. Uh, one is that you can use priors, uh, which is really valuable. So if you actually had some kind of qualitative information or a theoretical position on whether this should work, you can actually build that into the analysis. We do some of that in the paper. Another interesting thing, and I'll just jump to the next slide for time, is for the treatment on the treated effects for volunteers. So one of the things that Bayesian analysis can do in this hierarchical modeling is you have no pooling, which is kind of similar to to frequentist and partial pooling, which is in using information across the studies to update the information in every study. So in the frequentist meta-analysis, it just updated the average effect. Here, every effect can get updated. And so what you're essentially seeing is actually on this study, first UP camps, whereas this original effect is not statistically significant, that was actually because uh, take up here was very low, actually. I think in this case, it was about 7 or 8%. But in most of the other studies, take up was quite high, about 80%. And so it's using information on cases where take up is high uh, to update this information, and you have a statistically significant result. So it's a bit of a nerdy point, but TOT estimates are almost always underpowered. This is actually a neat way to power up your treatment on the treated effects. So anyway, there's some neat things about the Bayesian meta-analysis. I won't get too much into it. A few takeaways. Uh, implementation matters, and it matters most for generalizability in this case. Uh, I also want to make a bold claim that generalizability is attainable. Uh, maybe I'll get myself in trouble, but I'm going to put my neck out on the line. We found that this really can work across pretty diverse settings. I think Claire shared another interesting example uh, where that was the case. But it's rarely accounted for. Uh, luckily, we're a group of pessimists, so we were accurate, uh, but less than 12% of those uh, studies that we reviewed uh, had measured implementation. And actually, we we're now looking at meta-analyses, which I know uh, economists don't do as much, but education folks do and public health folks do uh, and psychologists do. Uh, we are finding 0% of meta-analyses are reporting treatment on the treated. So if you have a meta-analysis, you've seen that reports it, please let us know, but we haven't found one yet which we think is a real omission and, and we need to do better there. It also predicts the largest effects. The other thing that we do in the paper, which I haven't shown as much here, we actually just sound out a simple point and proof, and it kind of sounds obvious. We make the claim that if you don't measure implementation, you just can't point identify your treatment effect and you can't say something about generalizability. One, imagine this case where you have a null effect. This is sort of an extreme case. In a null effect, one minute, okay. In a null effect, if you didn't measure implementation, there's just no way to know if it was a good intervention that was done badly or a bad intervention that was done well. Okay. So this sounds obvious, but it's actually a really big issue. So we have to measure implementation if we wanna actually say something meaningful about the intervention. I actually wonder, maybe someone should do this study, uh, what percent of nulls were just bad implementation versus a program that, that really doesn't work. Okay, so there's a last piece to this. I don't know how much I'll get to say about this, but we then took this insight in Botswana, uh, Youth Impact. 
to optimize teaching at the right level as it was scaling to try to improve implementation. And one of the things that we did is we wanted to target instruction even more. And originally, we grouped kids by whether they could add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And you can see there's a bunch of variation there. We then also grouped them by how many digits they could recognize. And I know I'm coming to time, so I'm going to wrap up. Uh, and there, there's some variation too. So we had a treatment arm that grouped by just one uh, of the kind of operations and another treatment arm that grouped by mo both of them. So the idea was that it was even more targeted. And the bottom line is that actually improved uh, learning outcomes quite a bit by about 0.2 standard deviations. Uh, and so optimizing the targeting of instruction further uh, improved results. So sounds obvious, but you do a little bit more of what the principal is telling you you should do and your learning improves. So it wasn't the case that this implementation feature was just a correlation in our meta-analysis. It is causal. Okay, I'm going to end by saying implementation can and should be accounted for, studied, and improved. This is my last slide. It's a bit of a teaser for the end of the panel where we are going to talk about the What Works Hub for Global Education, whose focus is on implementation science. So that's just a bit of a teaser. More soon. I'll end on that. OK, great. Um, OK, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, really excited to be presenting um, this work today. Um, so before I begin, I should say that I'm going to pivot a little bit. So while the first two presentations were ma mainly looking at how to implement a specific policy, uh, this work looks at how bureaucrats should approach policy implementation through the delivery chain. I should also say that this is part of a larger program at the Blavatnik School, which was called Deliberate, which had a quant component as well as a qual. Um, today, in the interest of time, I'm focusing on the quant component, which is co-authored with Michael Boyce Yadam at UCC, Claire Lever and Maria Piayoko, and Claire and Maria are both in the room today. So let me just get started. Um, <clears throat> So essentially, the motivation for the study is that governments regularly commit to sector plans. These sector plans have a set of policies, and they commit to essentially delivering these plans. But these plans do not always translate into tangible improvements into outcomes that we care about. And you might say, well, this is because the design of policies in these sector plans is just not effective. But you know, we're also increasingly realizing that the quality of implementation by bureaucrats also matters. And thankfully, Noam and Claire have already established this as well. So think, for example, a minister of education. The minister of education designs a curriculum and wants to get this implemented. Now, the national level bureaucrats, they're going to be thinking about how to design this curriculum, what should be the components. But there's also going to be the mid-level bureaucrats who will have to implement a range of tasks to implement this. So think, for example, getting teachers trained to deliver the curriculum, getting learning materials into the school, so on and so forth. So there's implementation happening at the national and the mid-level. And what we're really trying to answer over here is that, well, in a setting like this, how should bureaucrats approach implementation from a management perspective to improve downstream outcomes through the delivery chain. That's what we're going to try to look at. So we're trying to study implementation from a, from a management perspective. Now, <clears throat> there's plenty of advice out there from consultants on how bureaucrats should implement policy. Many of you may have heard of uh, Barber's deliverology, so on and so forth. But the issue is that there's less empirical work looking at this question of how bureaucrats should approach policy implementation and what are the associated impacts through the delivery chain? There is emerging work, which is really exciting. So for example, Rasul and Rogger in Nigeria, they look at management practices at the national level and how they're associated with outcomes at the national level, such as task completion. There's also work by Silir Zadel, Yakubis is in the room, where they look at district level management practices and learning outcomes in schools. But again, there's little empirical evidence looking at you know, um, how bureaucrats are approaching implementation and outcomes through the delivery chain, not just at the national at the, uh, or the school level, but through the delivery chain. At the same time, there's this lively and um, exciting, I would say, conceptual debate across social sciences on the merits and demerits of different approaches to implementation. So on the one hand, public, uh, in public admin and education, there's a lot of focus on 
how you know practices of bureaucrats that focus on problem solving and adaptation deliberation they can really drive outcomes through the delivery chain they also talk about how there might be demerits of having tight controls and incentives on things like motivation but on the other hand you might contrast this with other disciplines um, I would say economists. So we think about, we think a lot about principal agent problems and how we might use incentives and top down ac accountability to improve effort and task completion. So, with this background, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do essentially two key things. The first thing that we do is that we develop a new tool to measure organizational approach to implementation. So the way we do this is we have 16 delivery related management practices. Now these practices are organized under four delivery functions. These are prioritization and target setting, monitoring and use of data, accountability and incentives and problem solving and adaptation. These functions were drawn from and based on the wider uh, deliver at conceptual framework that I can talk more about in the Q&A. And essentially, under these functions, we identified 16 different constructs through quite a lot of um, discussions with experts and feedbacks, bureaucrats and ministers who had worked on delivery. So this is how we come to these 16 different practices. And based on these, we essentially compute an index which gives us an overall index, which is essentially delivery related management practices, which are capturing the bureaucrats approach to policy implementation. In addition to this overall index, we also do another thing. We're also interested in the style of approach. And this kind of goes back to the conceptual debate that I was talking about. So we essentially try to capture through our measure whether an approach is more towards problem solving or whether it's more towards accountability and incentives. For problem solving approaches, think about practices such as feedback loops, deep dives through the delivery chain, and in accountability and incentives, things like high stakes accountability meetings and rewards and sanctions. Our measurement methodology is exactly the same as the WMS in the sense that we ask open ended questions and then post code through a predefined rubric. Now, in addition to measuring this organizational approach to implementation, we also uh, do another thing. We're also interested in really carefully understanding and conceptualizing measures which can tell us how bureaucrats are doing through the delivery chain. So here, our cons constructs are essentially a mix of things that bureaucrats are doing at the mid level and at the street level. So at the mid level, we're interested in things like staff effort, office task completion, office functioning, how are people actually feeling? Um, are they satisfied? Uh, do they understand what they're supposed to do, as well as things at the street level, such as head teacher um, and teacher effort and school functioning. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to get at, you know, this thin description around like, um, you know, uh, things like task completion, but also really getting a sense of how people are feeling. Um, and also um, our measurement methodology here is a mix of new um, uh, closed ended survey modules, as well as established instruments like the SDI. So essentially, we take those, these two things, and what we do is we apply this in the context of Ghanaian education districts, um, where we essentially con conduct our survey to generate new descriptive evidence. Now, I'm going to quickly tell you what we find before going into the details, in case there's um, just to kill the curiosity beforehand. Um, so the first thing that we find is that when we look at the approach to implementation, Generally, across districts in Ghana, um, there's um, essentially uh, we observe very low scores of delivery related management practices, which essentially means that these practices exist, but they're very ad hoc or quite informal. But at the same time, we see quite a bit of variation. So there's clearly some districts that are doing very well. They have high scores, but there are others who have low scores. The next thing that we look at, well, we know how the bureaucrats are approaching implementation in districts, but how are these essentially related to downstream outcomes through the delivery chain? And here, what I'm presenting is associations. This was not, this was not an RCT, so I'm presenting descriptive evidence. But essentially, um, what we find is that the overall delivery-related management index, it is associated, positively associated with some downstream outcomes. So not all of them, some of them. But interestingly, what we see is that not all of the delivery functions matter equally. 
Now, remember, I pointed out that we're interested in the style of the approach, whether it's more problem solving focused or whether it's more focused on top, top down accountability. And what we essentially see is that it's the problem solving focused approach, which is essentially driving some of these positive outcomes in the downstream delivery chain, not the top down accountability. And why is this important? So this is important because within Ghana, um, the government, the Ministry of Education, is attempting to cascade a national level approach down to the district level. And there's a very strong emphasis on top-down accountability, essentially things like performance contracts. But our evidence over here, and even the related qualitative work that we did, it actually suggests otherwise. It suggests caution and thinking more carefully about the kind of approaches you're cascading down. And from a research side, it essentially calls for a pivot towards thinking more carefully about problem solving approaches and their causal, um, causal effects. Um, so this with, with this snapshot, I'm just going to dig deep into some of the details and um, give you a snapshot of the results. So, <clears throat> so I just wanted to show this table, um, you know, just to highlight what we measure and how. And this is just to say that we really did try uh, very carefully to capture things through the delivery chain. So we're capturing things in the district office in terms of effort, task completion, how offices are functioning, and the same thing at the school level. And I'm happy to speak more about um, you know, what exactly these constructs look, look like in the Q&A. This is a map of Ghana. We pretty much went everywhere. It was a representative district sample. And essentially, in the northern part, we went to another 1,200 uh, 1, schools. Because we were interested in capturing um, you know, measures through the delivery chain, we surveyed the district director, but also the deputy director and the circuit supervisors who are essentially interfacing between districts and schools. Um, in Pakistan, they're called AEOs and similar kind of um, you know, civil servants in, in other settings as well. And then of course, um, you know, 1261 teachers as well. Um, so this is the first result that I showed you, which essentially showed that um, you know, how a district office is approaching implementation. So the table over here shows the 16 different practices that we measured. And the core thing to emphasize is that scores are low. So typically, uh, principally actually, scores are supposed to be between one to four, but we see a score of two, which means that the practices are quite ad hoc really. The average district, district does well on priority setting. So the districts know what their priorities are, but they don't do very well on strategic planning which essentially means they don't have the necessary work plans and things that you need to follow through with these priorities. We see a greater use of problem solving than accountability. But again, the point that I was making, there's a lot of variation. So over here, I'm showing you the four functions, and these are the scores from one to four. And I don't have to explain this because you can see that there's quite a bit of variation. There's some who are doing well and some where the scores are really low. This is showing the style. The dark green is accountability focused and the light is problem solving focused. And you can see that, you know, it's, it was interesting to us that regions that are close to central Accra are where, you know, there were more accountability focused practices. And there's another discussion to be had, which is where are these practices really coming from? Now, what were the associations between these delivery related management practices and downstream outcomes? How do they really matter? Um, so again, uh, what we did was, the, um, you know, we did we were basically showing associations. I'm not going to go into the regression equation, but essentially we tried to control for as many observables as we could, as well as geograph ge geography, following Rasul and Roger and Blue Mattel. And what we find is, which I've also given you a snapshot already, that the overall management index is positively associated associated with outcomes. Which ones are those? effort of district staff. So districts where there was you know, a higher delivery management index were the ones where district staff were going to the classrooms more. They were sitting in on classroom observations, sitting in on lesson plans, so on and so forth. We also see effects on effort of school staff where there was a higher overall delivery management index. We also saw that their teachers were showing more active instruction and less students off task. But again, not all of these functions were mattering equally. And there were different results depending on whether you were doing more of the accountability focused practices or more problem solving. And essentially, when we look at these um, associations by the sub indices, 
there's no positive relationship between the top-down accountability sub-index and downstream outcomes. But it's the problem solving that's driving the results. And essentially what we see is that districts where there's higher problem solving, staff are happier and less likely to leave. Also, where districts have a higher problem solving index, there is less teacher absenteeism and less students off task. So I'm, I'm going to try to conclude now. Um, so on the policy side, I've already given you the policy implications, right? Um, this, has, this has clear implications for how the Ministry of Education is thinking about cascading its delivery approach. And essentially what we're showing is caution, that we need to be a bit careful about how we do this through the delivery chain. Um, on the research side, we're calling for a pivot in economics, which we're seeing now in works by Rasul and Robert, uh, Bandiera et al., where they're showing that things where you are encouraging autonomy, well, their autonomy is a slightly different thing, but essentially we're calling for similar attention to things like problem solving, deliberation, and understanding the causal impact of these kind of practices. All of our instruments will be publicly available. Um, some can be applied across context, some not so much. I'm happy to talk through the details of this. And I just want to end with what I started. So this was part of a larger study called the Deliver Ed Program, where we had a quant component and a qual component. We spent a lot of time thinking about common conceptual frameworks because ultimately our aim was that we wanted to integrate these pieces to be able to add more nuance around the discussion of implementation, around the discussion of delivery. Because clearly things like what happens in these offices, what is the culture like, these things play a big role. Um, there are some other papers on the PSG webpage, but we're also working together towards an integrated piece, will be, which will be coming up in an IJET special issue. Um, I'm going to stop here and um, looking forward to questions. So I'll take three questions. So I'm going to start over there. So the two people raising their hands over there. Thank you so much for very good presentations. I think this is a very important area of work. My first question is for Claire. So I'm still wrapping my head around the 0.89 standard deviation impact for Uganda. So, uh, so what happened in Uganda in terms of like the with the school closures? Do you have measures of like the trajectory of learning? That what was the extent of the learning loss? One standard deviation is about two grades of learning. So in what time period? these kids were able to absorb this kind of learning so that you have this uh, differential with the, with the control group. And just a tiny bit on the overall implementation side. So, I, so Noam, this is for you in terms of like how, how do we measure everything in implementation? So it's a classic McNamara fallacy that like whatever you, you will measure, the rest will be disregarded in terms of the implementation. So when we are developing these modules, we are going into kind of like with, with certain priors in terms of like what the implementation decisions look like. So what is being missed could be an important part and who will, who will get to decide on that. Hi, Mpumi from South Africa. Two questions. One is if you've measured, Claire, any long-term um, sustained impacts. So COVID is a specific context. Um, yeah, were you able to follow up? And then to the last presenter, you spoke about, it sounds like there should be trade-offs between problem solving and accountability. What's the, what are those? And what's the one thing we shouldn't do? Um, it sounds like you are more for problem solving. What's the thing we should drop? Thanks. Yeah, thank you to all the uh, presenters. A question mainly for Noam. How would your results fit into the context of its say detailed critique of RCTs saying, oh, I can generate a lot of treatment effects um, just from randomness, basically, that you might pick up in your RCTs. So would you say, while well, the distribution is a bit more centered and um, not so spread out as Dieter might claim, 
start with you, Claire. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for the questions. Uh, on Uganda, so as I mentioned, students had been out of school for two years at that point. And then when we look at, I think there's some Uezu data and some of our own data that suggests so in a lot of these countries, the government's main alternatives that they were providing were like television, radio, um, or online programs, or maybe paper packs. And like the highest rate we could see that just people were accessing that was like 30% of students accessing in a really great case, mostly between like know, two and 15% of households. So people were not accessing much else. So the control group was not getting great stuff and it had two years away, but certainly huge, huge effect sizes. Um, so I think the lack of alternatives mattered and the fact that it was two years away, it was also just like a really effective program uh, and had like a great organization implementing. Um, yeah, I guess we're still like Youth Impact is still delivering this post COVID and is finding very positive learning effects. I think there's like a lot of RCT evidence now, but pre post it's very effective still. Um, but yeah, good question. Uh, and Bhumi, the question about long term, we have not gone back to measure. We could at some point, though. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Zara. Yeah. Um, no, that's a great question and, and something that we've been um, trying to answer. So I'm going to say um, uh, the annoying thing that I, I don't think we have the evidence to say which one we should drop. And essentially, I think that's where why we need more causal evidence. But I will share some things that we found from the cross case study and generally anecdotally how we saw things evolve in Ghana. Um, so gen because the study was in, in you know, uh, four different countries, essentially what we saw was that when you have accountability focused, top down accountability focused practices, they do get you some things. So for example, at the national level, they do help bring people together, there's coordination, and it can help you achieve, um, you know, formal structural changes, like for example, getting a curriculum approved and those sort of things, but they are difficult in kind of pushing through, um, you know, changes in downstream outcomes. And uh, what we saw in Ghana, for example, was that the ministry initially started with a very top-down accountability focused approach at the national level. But over time, because there was pushback from the other agencies, um, they essentially started moving towards a more problem-solving oriented approach. So, and this has happened, you know, we essentially mapped these kind of approaches in another project across, you know, 199 countries. And we see this happening quite a bit where you see kind of, you know, countries initially adopting a more top-down accountability focused approach, but ultimately moving towards that's you know, more of a hybrid. But again, I think we need more causal evidence here. Uh, we don't know what happens, you know, when you do one versus the other, or when you do a hybrid, and it would be really nice if you we were able to do that. But it's obviously a very difficult thing to do in reality randomizing districts and whole government units into type of approaches can can be very very difficult but we can make we can do a lot of sense making with you know descriptive evidence and and qualitative work here as well thanks sure um you know that problem that you mentioned is a problem and it's a problem i'd like to have because i don't think we're there yet i don't think we're measuring implementation enough in the first place to worry about having the wrong measurement. But we should preempt it, I, I agree. But I think first let's have, the fir let, let's first have measures of implementation that we're consistently bringing into our work. And then, uh, you know, if we overdo it, you know, we can, we can address that. So I think first and foremost, I would say we, we should start measuring it. I think, um, you know, I think two, dimensions of it which are important are take up and fidelity but there might be more there might be more and i'd be curious people's views on what should come into that and those aren't cookie cutter measures take up is a bit more consistent did it happen did people receive it fidelity needs to be contextualized for each intervention so that's not like you can have a single fidelity measure you know so in the case you know claire shared for example fidelity would mean targeting instruction for another program it would mean something else so that needs to be constructed carefully for the intervention uh, so those are two dimensions, uh, and I think you know it's it's possible. There's a third. There's a fourth. I'd love to to hear from people, but I think first let's let's measure it, uh, and then hopefully we we can make sure we don't miss something. Um, on the critique of RCTs, and I'm sure Lant has the same critique. I think Lant is is here. I'm sure we'll hear from him soon. Um, the uh, I would say um, I'm I think this kind of work gives us a bit of optimism. I think it's true that. Um, RCTs have not always generalized, right? And, and so 
that's something that we need to be mindful of and cognizant of. I think in this case, it reveals that they might generalize better than we thought, actually, uh, or at least in this case, and if we accounted for the right thing. So I would just say I'm, I'm slightly more optimistic, uh, but I'm sure there's a good debate to be had. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, another set of questions over there. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for the presentations. They were great. And it's interesting to see the kind of delineation between the TOT and the ITT and, and, and kind of isolating maybe the effects of implementation fidelity issues. That said, we don't want to let people off the hook, right, in terms of moving to more of a uh, just a treatment on the treated in terms of the impact estimates. But my bigger question is, when did we move to point one standard deviations as an effective program? Like I, I missed, I feel like I missed the memo because, um, sorry, I'm just like, I'm actually like really surprised because historically, modest small effect sizes, like something you would power a study to, would be 0 0.2, 0 0.25, right? Those are some of the standards set by the What Works Clearinghouse and things like that. I know from, you know, when it was at USAID, those were like the non embarrassing things that you invested in, right? And then 0 0.4, 0 0.6, you know, medium, of course, it all depends on cost, you know, all depends on your distribution, right? There's nuances to it. And 0 0.8 being a large, where large started. So today, as I sit here, and I, and I think this is something I thought about too, I feel like we've introduced a reference bias because we're not doing a very good job, right? So we look at the landscape of evaluations and set these thresholds for success that are based on a lot of really not good policy implementation donor funded programs. And so I think real, rather, why don't we take a look at how many standard deviations for a normal distribution or whatever modeling we wanna pick and say, okay, how, how, where does this get, right? A first grader today to by the time they end up with fifth grade right, in these kinds of effect sizes that we're talking about. And you can use multiple, you know, distributions and model that out or whatever. It's nowhere. I mean, I don't even have to like do the math, it's nowhere. So, sorry, I just, I wanna know where that standard got, um, I hate people that make speeches and don't ask questions. I'm so sorry, I've become one of them. But I wanna know like where that reference point came. Okay. Yeah, so that's my question. Thank you. Sorry, uh, there so was a question here, here. <laughs> Um, hi, this is Andrea from the UK. Thank you. I've really enjoyed your presentations. I just have a quick curiosity for Claire. If someone wanted to implement this program in a new setting, what would you say are some of the limitations or perhaps the caveats that you would share and say, well, beware of this or it wouldn't work in this situation? Thank you. Thank you. Two quick questions here, please. You and yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you, uh, Daniel from the Lehman Foundation in Brazil. I would like to to ask uh, Zara uh, about uh, one issue that occurred to me, which was uh, the issue of state capacity, and uh, if that was a variable that might be interesting to look at, looking at the the approaches to implementation. What I, I guess my hypothesis would be that when you talk about uh, top-down accountability measures, maybe districts with more state capacity can have more uh, capacity really to respond to these incentives than the others. So would that be uh, uh, an interesting approach to also look at into this, this very interesting work that you've been doing? So yeah, thank you. And, or, or whoever hasn't asked a question. Um, my question is to, Claire, thank, thanks for the presentation. I was just wondering in terms of Uganda, again, the SMS uh, standard deviations um, has been pretty high. Um, just wondering if you looked at the cost of sending SMSs in, across the five, five countries. So I'm just thinking that, say, not many people receive SMSs in Uganda if the cost of sending an SMS is, is pretty high. Um, and the sec second one was the last presenter. Um, so yeah, hi, Sarah. Um, so I, I'm just curious if in Ghana, it's 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 a pretty hierarchical top-down approach in general in education system, in which case, just curious how the research team approach interviewing the district education officers or, or the like, equivalent and getting honest um, responses to treat the measures that, that, that you are describing. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, um, 
You want to take the hard question? Sure. Where this where this reference came <laughs> from? My goodness. Um, <laughs> It, I, I agree with much of what you said, actually. Um, so maybe we, I should use a different reference point next time. But um, yeah, I think it did come from literature reviews, essentially looking at the state of affairs. Of course, I'd be curious to hear from, from others in the room. But um, yes, I think that's right. And the state of affairs are not good. So it's a good point. We should aim higher. Um, that's actually part of the motivation for the study is we said, yes, it worked, but how do we get to point eight, actually? And even better is maybe even moving from standard deviations, right, to all children reading, all children numerate, basic numeracy. Um, so yeah, just agree with that point and agree we should aim higher. That would be my, my quick response. <clears throat> yeah, um, thanks for the questions. Um, so on the first uh, question about uh, state capacity, um, so, so I'll say two things. One is that we were interested in looking at, you know, where what explains the cross-district variation in these approaches to implementation. Uh, I didn't present that today, uh, and we need to do a bit more work on that. But essentially, we were interested in understanding whether it's um, internal characteristics within the districts. So, for example, you know, the um, you know characteristics of the district director, characteristics of the district, such as you know staff skills. Um, so to what extent do these internal characteristics explain the variation versus external factors, things like local political sponsorship that the district might have, things like, you know, external donor support. And what we see, at least in our data, that it's the external factors that explain, you know, who is adopting a more thorough approach to implementation. So it was essentially districts which had more donor support, um, and there is a lot of it in Ghana. And then the second thing was having local sponsorship uh, from the local political MP. So those were the things driving, not so much the internal uh, you know, district characteristics. But I also think that it's really hard to understand what state capacity really means. So how do we measure it? How do we think about it? So we were thinking about it you know, in terms of these specific measures, in terms of you know, what the district staffing was like, and even performance measures within the district. So I think that's another black box to perhaps unfold. How do we think about state district capacity or state capacity? Um, on the second question about, you know, how do we make sense of these results? Um, yes, um, the education system is hierarchical as in many other low and middle income countries, but actually we don't know a lot about what is the variation in these approaches to management and implementation at the mid level. Um, Kanata here has done a lot of work on school management practices and we know there's a lot of variation there. Um, and what we're seeing is that it's the case in Ghana as well. There is a lot of variation and districts are using these different types of practices. And from the call work, happy to chat more over coffee, we have a lot of Thanks to our amazing qualitative colleagues at UCC, Ottawa, and U of T. Um, but essentially, we have a lot of really good examples of what does it mean when a district is doing problem solving? Um, you know, what are the kind of things that they're doing? And what, it, what is a district that's not doing problem solving? So we have those case studies, and hopefully you'll see them in some output or another. <laughs> Um, great. Um, thank you for the questions. So I've been trying to wrap my brains and think where this wouldn't work. So I guess we know it works across different types of implementers. We have lots of different kinds of partners, government, NGO. So that, that doesn't meet the need. I guess we're doing it outside COVID and it's still working. Um, so I guess if you have a phone and if you can target, it seems to work well. However, we have done uh, another study looking at adolescents and like HIV prevention knowledge. And we have found like after COVID, adolescents are hard to pin down. They're a bit too cool. Maybe they're not really interested in chatting to someone in their 20s about like dating. Um, so yes, probably better for like primary school students. Um, and then also another thing that has come up a lot is people are keen for us to try this with literacy. And we are keen to crack that nut. Um, but it is obviously a bit harder with literacy than with numeracy, um, like seeing letters written quickly with SMSs and that kind of thing. Uh, and then on the other question about SMS cost effectiveness, I wonder if you are our reviewer. A reviewer has asked for the same thing. So, <laughs> so we're in the process of calculating that one, but that's an important question. And maybe in like extreme conflict settings, that's very easy and very cost effective to do. But in other places where the counterfactual is not so bad, maybe it's less cost effective. Great. Um, over there. Uh, Peter from Stellenbosch and Freya University. 
quick question for Noam. Is it plausible that fidelity or take up often correlate with unscalable or endogenous factors like human resource constraints? Thanks. I think that's all we have time for. So, okay. Um, so, I would say that is, you know, that is, you know, one of the arguments actually. Therefore, we should care about mostly intention to treat because that's the policy relevant quantity. Our view and the view that we take in this paper is not necessarily actually, partially because implementation varies so much. So in these studies, sometimes it was 7%, but often it was 80 to 90%. And so it's not this fixed variable. And it's not that it can't budge and it's not that it can't be that high. And in fact, the studies that had the highest implementation were actually the largest scale studies, tens of thousands of children. So they weren't necessarily the smallest studies. So I think if you conceive as implementation as unmovable, yes. But if implementation can be improved, no. Then the quantity of interest is how do you get this to be implemented well and to achieve that highest effect. That's also partially what the A-B test also brings some evidence to bear on is Again, making this point that implementation is not fixed, it can be improved, and then it has an effect. So I think that's often the argument, and part of the point that we try to make in this paper is it can vary, it can be improved, and it can be quite high, actually. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, we will, um, I'll give you five minutes for your presentation. You have your slides up? Sure, yes. I'm um, supposed yeah. to, um, well, I'm supposed to say three takeaways. I'm going to skip that just to give Noam some time to present on uh, the World Bank Hub. Yeah? Sure. Uh, I, so I'm just going to, uh, because it's an implementation panel, uh, and I'm sure some people are wondering um, what's next after RISE. Uh, I believe I have two slides. I think they're going to come up, but I can also speak um, without them. Oh, that's a T statistic. That is definitely not what I was going to talk about. Um, are there other slides? Uh, I can talk about T statistics. I can do that. Um, well, I'll just keep talking. Uh, it's okay if the slides don't come. Um, and we'll have a panel soon also, which is also trying to bridge the transition. So this is just uh, riffing off of the implementation uh, uh, panel. Um, so. I would say maybe, and I'm curious how people would characterize after um, Rise, there is a, a cousin, maybe a sibling, uh, some relation that is close and, and trying to build on the incredible efforts of Rise, which have really been incredible, uh, but also with a slightly new flavor. Uh, and that is the What Works Hub for Global Education. Oh, here it is, okay, great. Uh, and the goal of the What Works Hub for Global Education is really to build an implementation science uh, because we know children are in school and not necessarily learning but we're that's the bad news the good news is there are things that improve learning uh, and we have many people in this room generated evidence on those things how do we now scale them scale them with governments and implement them really well and so let's do that and then let's also try to get rigorous and scientific about how to do that so that's the goal uh, with the what works hub for global education uh, also has a large investment from fcdo uh, 30 million pounds to start uh, with additional strategic partners coming in as well uh, so that's the goal through the what works hub uh, we're estimating that about 3 million children will be reached so it's direct scaling and effort uh, through partners. It's a consortium of about 40 partners is the uh, BSG component of the What Works Hub. Uh, and that includes a mix of researchers. Uh, it includes a mix of implementers, of donor partners, uh, of governments. Uh, and, and there's a lot of partnerships with governments. A very, very exciting effort. Uh, and in addition to the BSG component, there's also a wider What Works Hub effort uh, and I'm sure uh, Rachel will mention some of this in the panel in the next panel, uh, which is also linking in with strategic partners like the World Bank, uh, which is very exciting and other um, partners as well, uh, UNICEF, uh, IIEP and, and a few others. Um, so we're very, very excited about this effort. So we're hoping everyone who's applied and come to this conference will continue to uh, come back through the uh, new and, and kind of recurring conferences that are coming. We actually just had our internal launch over the last couple of days uh, where we're in inception period and over 
over the next year, we'll really be shaping the hub. Uh, and then we will launch officially more publicly uh, throughout the year and next year. I think I have one or two more slides, but I think I actually covered most of it. We can flip through. Uh, is there another one or two? Yeah, this is a, a kind of set of images and pictures of various partners in the consortium uh, so far, uh, though we, we're also hoping to expand over time. Next slide. Uh, and this is the, the slide on the strategic partners uh, through the What Works Hub for Global Education, uh, which is part of the, the larger business case that FCDO has. So, yeah, that's in a nutshell. Happy to discuss it more, and I'm sure it'll come up in the next panel as well. Thank you.